Right? Allah says even if you do something small, Allah will multiply it. You might not think much of it. But if you become more, more mindful when you're making wudu, your salah is going to be better. If you just take this little small step, you're going to notice something, your, your consciousness of Allah has changed. If you start just being mindful that you're walking into your home with the right foot and you're making a dua. Small little deed takes you less than five seconds to do that, but it might actually have a multiplied effect on your consciousness and your awareness of Allah. In today's khutbah, I'll be sp speaking to you about a few reflections, just some lessons that we can take from the opening ayah of Surah An-Nisa. That is the fourth surah of the Quran in the Mus'haf order and an early surah revealed to the Prophet ﷺ when he was in Medina. It's one of the largest surahs in the Quran also. And you'll notice that the, some of the largest surahs in the Quran are also in the beginning of the Mus'haf. Some things you should know about the larger surahs is that in the introduction of the larger surahs, Allah will mention a few comments, introductory comments, and those are the most comprehensive, rich comments. Allah will mention lots of things in this surah, but the opening is going to be this orientation. And in fact, this time the orientation is just a handful of ayat. And the first of them is extremely comprehensive. In the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, we learned that this is an ayah that Rasul used to encourage and also recite in the nikah ceremony. So when people are getting married, this ayah would be recited. This was a common practice of the Prophet Ya ayyuhan nasu taqu rabbakum Humanity, so this is an address to all human beings, not just Muslims. He says, be, be spiritually conscious of your master. The one who created you from a single person. And from out of that person, he created his spouse. Meaning he's talking about Adam and Hawa. And through the both of them, he spread from both of them many men. وَنِسَاءَ and many women وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ الَّذِي تَسَاءَلُونَ بِهِ and be mindful and spiritually conscious of Allah in whose name you ask each other for things let me explain what this means briefly in whose الَّذِي تَسَاءَلُونَ بِهِ in whose name you ask each other for things you know in Urdu this is Allah ke vaaste meri madad kar do Khuda ka vaaste ye baat mat karna you know Billah qif you know just I swear just in Allah's name just please stop you know, for God, in English we say, for God's sake, can you please do this for me, right? We have these phrases where we call on Allah's name and we ask somebody in the, in the hoping that their sense of faith to Allah will be enough for them to do something or stop doing something. For Allah's sake, please don't do this anymore. Please don't do that anymore, you know? So the taqwa of Allah, there's a few things. There's hundreds of things we learn about it, but there's only two or three things that I'm going to mention to you. And as I mentioned each one, we're going to see what we might learn from that, from the taqwa of Al-Arham. So the first of them I want to mention to you is small deeds. وَإِن تَكُوا حَسَنَةً يُضَعِفْهَا Right? Allah says even if you do something small, Allah will multiply it. You might not think much of it. But if you become more, more mindful when you're making wudu, your salah is going to be better. If you just take this little small step, you're going to notice something, your, your consciousness of Allah has changed. If you start just being mindful that you're walking into your home with the right foot and you're making a dua. Small little deed takes you less than five seconds to do that, but it might actually have a multiplied effect on your consciousness and your awareness of Allah. When you're getting in the car and you're making dua for travel, right? A Muslim dua for travel. If Again, 10 seconds or less, you can make that dua. But it's going to be hard for you to start the car and go somewhere Allah doesn't want you to go if you made that dua first. You understand? So small elements of dhikr, what do they do? They bring about the taqwa of Allah. Small, small things add up. And when you start getting rid of those small things, one by one, you're like, that's not fart. I don't have to do it. It's not, it's not mandatory. I'm not kafir if I don't do it. Fine, you're not kafir. You're not non-Muslim. You're, you're, you, know, you, didn't, you didn't sin technically. But you know what you're doing? You're diluting taqwa. You're diluting the awareness of Allah. You're not, I'm not mentioning Him as much anymore. I'm not thinking about Him as much anymore. And when I'm not thinking about Him as much, in my conversations, I might notice that I start talking about people a lot more. Or I notice that I'm using foul language a lot more. I'm noticing that I'm maybe laughing at others a lot more. I've become more cruel. More, I'm become, I've become meaner. I'm generous a lot less. So what might we learn from that on the side of Al-Arham? Al-Arham means all of our relationships. There are small things that you and I can do in our relationships that annoy each other. A wife can do very small little things. Every time you hear her do it or see her do it, you're like, mm, 
but you just do mm, and you just keep going, right? And just like when you don't remember Allah properly and you don't do these small dhikrs, over time the heart starts getting harder and harder. Your these small annoyances that the husband does towards the wife or the wife does towards the husband, over time, what does it do? It starts distancing their hearts. They're still living in the same home. They still fulfill all of their responsibilities. They're still raising the kids together. They're still, all of those things are going on. But emotionally, slowly but surely, because of small, small things, like she always laughs at me when I does this, or he always says that when I do this, or he's always commenting on this or this, and she doesn't bring it up, and she doesn't say anything. I'm just going to have sabr. And this sabr, 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 sabr eventually becomes, he, I don't like him. He's so annoying. And in fact, when the husband says, hey, I'm going on a trip for two days, inside of her heart, she's like, takbir. Like I'm so happy that he's gone for two days. I don't have to put up with those habits. You know, like there's a, the, the, the absence of the loved one should cause distress, should cause sadness. But what's happened over time because of these small, small acts of insensitivity, one to the other, the other to the first, that they actually celebrate being far apart from each other. They're happier when they're not around. Or, the, you know, you're really happy when he's not home. You're like calling your friends, you're happy, you're smiling. And the moment he walks in, you're like, oh. And your energy disappears because he's here, right? Or she does the same thing to you, or you do the same thing to her. And you could do this towards your children. Small, small things that pull siblings apart from each other. Small things that put, pull parents and children apart from each other. So it's the, the first thing that we learn about taqwa on the, on the spiritual side. Our taqwa to Allah is small deeds. When you, when you and I become mindful of them, they add up. And they start affecting bigger things. So that's the first. The second thing, let's take a little, a little bit of a bigger step. The taqwa of Allah can also be, you know, in, in our, uh, you know, our thoughts. Allah is directly connecting in the Quran, mindfulness of Allah and spiritual awareness of Allah. He's directly connecting it with the way that we think. أَفَلَا تَعْقِلُونَ You know, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَفَكَّرُونَ Why don't you think? Why don't you ponder? Why don't you think deeply? Well, and Allah even says, about us, says to us that there are things we can say that are offensive to Allah. You know, كَبُرَ مَقْتًا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ تَقُولُ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ You can say things about Allah that you don't know of. So there's thoughts and there's speech. So I'll make a quick comment about thoughts and speech. You see, what happens is, we, when we turn to Allah with taqwa, we make dua to Allah for forgiveness. When we pray to Allah, we have to be aware of our own mistakes. Right? I have to be aware of my flaws. I have to be aware of my sins. And I know there's no secrets between me and Allah. Allah knows how messed up I am. Allah knows all of my failures. Allah knows all of my flaws. I can't pretend in front of Allah and say, Ya Allah, I'm not that bad. You know, Allah knows exactly how bad. And I know that Allah knows. So I have, I have an unfiltered conversation with Allah and I'm very real about myself. And I don't want Allah to judge me based on one mistake or based on even a hundred mistakes. Ya Allah, I know I've made a hundred mistakes. Ya Allah, you know I made a thousand mistakes, but you know that in my heart I want to make a change. You know that in my heart I'm not I'm gonna try my best never to make those mistakes again. You have this, if you truly have taqwa, you have a confession to Allah and you don't pass judgment on yourself, you're real about yourself, right? You're real about yourself. But if you gave up on yourself, think about that for a moment. If you gave up on yourself and said, you know what, I've made way too many mistakes, I messed up anyway. If you give up on yourself, then it's impossible for you to have a real conversation with Allah. In fact, you'll avoid it. What, what is the point of me talking to Allah now? What is the point of me praying to Him now? I'm already messed up. There's no, it's not like He's going to forgive me. So even the taqwa of Allah and what results from the taqwa of Allah, the dua to Allah, the prayer to Allah, all of that cannot happen if I'm not real about myself and vulnerable before Allah. Now let's bring that to our relationships. What happens in our relationships sometimes is if, if I made a mistake, if I made a mistake, that's because I was really mad. Or, you know, you did this, this, this. That's why I made this mistake. Or it's understandable. You know, it just, it happened. I messed up. Fine, I messed up. It happened. But if your spouse makes a mistake, if your child makes a mistake, if, you know, they always do that. That's how they always are. You're not looking at their mistake. You're looking at their heart behind the mistake. And you're saying, this person, the, the reason they, they spoke like this is because they're filled with hate. They're filled with arrogance. They're this way, they're this way, they're this way. I've already judged them, their intentions, not their action. I've already judged their intentions. When it comes to myself, I only want somebody to judge my action and never my intention. 
I messed up, but that wasn't my intention. And you know, it's, it, it makes it a lot more innocent. But when somebody else messes up in the relationship, you're, the first thing we go after is their intention. This is who they really are. So that's another thing we have to be, be, become. When Allah says, what taqul arham, what I'm tell, trying to tell you is, if we're going to have taqwa of the relationships, then that means we have to be mindful of the things that can destroy the relationship, that can separate the hearts. And taqwa, by the way, is in the hearts. Right? At taqwa hahuna. Quran says, فَإِنَّ ذَلِكَ مِن تَقْوَى الْقُلُوبِ that, that is from the taqwa of the hearts. So this taqwa also has to do with uh, the way we feel towards someone. The way we feel towards Allah, and in this case, the way we feel towards family members. Right? And, and those two things go hand in hand. A third one that's a little bit more sensitive is actually money matters. Money matters. In our religion, money is a big deal. Earning halal is a big deal. Giving zakat is a fundamental pillar. Not consuming haram money is a big deal. Right? Riba is a big problem. It's a serious thing. So, and, and stealing is a serious thing. Not giving the, the, the widow her share or not giving the inheritance, these are big crimes. These are, Allah has elaborated financial crimes in great detail. In fact, Allah has even talked about bribery and using your influence to gain advantage in business and things like that, or, or corrupting politicians. Right? Don't, 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 don't give your money to buy influence so some people can consume the money at the expense of everyone else. Don't do those kinds of things. So financial corruption is actually a, a major component of taqwa. By the way, that ayah that I just mentioned about financial you know, uh, 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 com uh, consciousness and being mindful of not being corrupt with your money is mentioned right after the ayat of Ramadan. The, the, the month in which we develop taqwa, right after you have taqwa, fix your money situation. Right? Don't be corrupt with your money. Well, we need to bring the money conversation into the family matters too. If we're going to have taqwa of al-arham, then it has to be that inheritance disputes are solved by Allah's book with taqwa. When you, when you get married, you have to take financial responsibility for your spouse. You know, وَبِمَا أَنْفَقُوا مِنْ أَمْوَالِهِمْ I cannot take, ask my wife to pay the bills. I can't tell my wife to go... That if you couldn't support her financially... Then you shouldn't be, you know, you shouldn't be in the, you know, uh, taking the nikah contract on and then saying, well, you know, you have to pay your own. Or you go to a restaurant, you're like, well, I only ate two pieces of chicken. That means I'm paying eighteen thirty-seven. You you ate three pieces of chicken. You pay twenty-one thirty-five. <laughs> it's not gonna work. That's not taqwa wal arham. Wabima an min amwalihim. You gotta spend on the kids. You gotta spend on your. You, you have to take care of your parents. And what happens sometimes in this taqwa? Is that because a lot of times men are in, by the way, men are not the only ones in this situation. Sometimes women are in a situation where they're earning all the income. You know, that happens too. There, there are situations like that. And there are sometimes understandable situations like that. Like the daughter of the old man in, in, in you know, in Madian, whose daughters were, were basically taking the animals out to graze. So they're the ones making the money in the house, right? That's in the Quran, in Surah Al-Qasas. So situations like that can happen. Or there was a married couple and the husband became disabled and the wife has to do work. And she's supporting him financially. Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha supported Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam financially for a time. There are situations like that exist that are based on mutual understanding. That's different. That's a separate thing. But outside of that, what I'm trying to tell you is I cannot impose a financial obligation that Allah did not impose. And I cannot make... Just like in the taqwa of Allah, I cannot make haram what Allah has made halal. And I cannot make halal what Allah has made haram. The same way in my financial dealings, I cannot tell my wife, hey, I don't like my mother, I don't like your mother. Don't give her a gift this Eid. I can't do that. Why is she she doesn't have a right to give her mother a gift? She doesn't have a right to take care of her cousin who needs a loan or what? It's her, it's her choice. That's a goodness that Allah has made that halal for. In fact, it's even an act of ibadah. Why would I stop her from doing that? And the same way she cannot stop the husband. Hey, uh, you said you're going to give your mom this, this, this. Why are you going to give her this, this, this? Your mom has enough. You know, or your dad has enough. You know, she can't do that to you. And your mother can't come along and say, Ah, I see you're taking your wife on a vacation, huh? Don't take me on a vacation. <laughs> right? Uh, your wife has a right. She has a right. 
and you, you, your mom can't come and impose her judgments on how you're going to spend on your spouse or your children. So you're stuck in the middle. Everybody hates you because whoever you spend on, you make somebody else angry. Congratulations on being a man, right? But, but the idea is, the idea is that you have to have taqwa of Allah in that you don't, you're mindful that you're being fair in all of your financial dealings, in all of your financial responsibilities, and you're giving people what their rights are, that's actually part of what taqul arham. In fact, early commentators on this ayah said that this what taqul arham has to do with inheritance law first, because inheritance law is coming later on. In other words, they understood taqwa of the close relationships will have to do with money matters. The ugliest family dispute happens when the wealthy father dies and the children are at each other's throats. Oh, when somebody dies and everybody's like, who's going to get the house? Who's going to get the car? Who's going to get the land? Who's going to get the farm? Who's going to get this? Who's going to get that? And there's this, uh, people that used to be brothers and hugging each other at Eid are now taking each other to court. For what? For a goat? For a house? For just a patch of land? Which you're going to be under it in a little bit. But you're destroying family ties because of it. So money is yet another thing that we have to be mindful of in terms of Allah, but also in terms of family. The final thing I'm going to mention is time. Is time. Allah has created this, this system of taqwa with Him and it revolves around time. There are specific times when I'm supposed to pray. There's a specific time when we go to hajj. We're in hajj season now. May Allah accept the hajj of all of the hujjaj. And those of us that haven't had the rizq to go to hajj, that Allah provide you the rizq to go to hajj. So, there's a specific time for hajj, there's a specific time for fasting, there's a specific time for prayer, there's a specific time for Eid. The entire religion and our taqwa of Allah, our mindfulness of Allah is actually about taking advantage of particular times. And even voluntary times, there are special times to make dua. There are special times to make adhkar. وَالْمُسْتَغْفِرِينَ بِالْأَسْحَارِ حِينَ تُصْبِحُونَ You know, early mornings, late at night. There, there, are, there are times, 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 and times. Well, if we apply that formula and what it could mean for our families, then there are times that we have to give. Rasul Sallallahu used to give a lot of times to his spouses. There's a, there's, there has to be dedicated time where people that have a relationship with you feel like they got your individual attention. If you, for example, have three children, right? And... The only time you talk to them is how was dinner, how school, blah, blah, blah. But you know what? There's a time where it's just you and your daughter. Even if it's 10 minutes, it's just you and her. She got exclusive time from you, right? And you made it into a habit. You disciplined yourself. This is the time, hey, it's daughter time. Come here. And there's, there's a set time. Like I said before, it could be a small thing. Could it, it could be life-changing in the psyche of that child. It could be life-changing. It could be that you're living with your wife, you're living with her for 20 years, but you never actually take time other than the groceries, the shopping, the bill, the kids, the commute, the this, the that, the other. Somebody's always around, we're always talking about, no, 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 there's a time, we're just going to go for a walk. Just you and I are just going to go for a walk and we're going to talk. This is our time, No, there's no phone, everything's on airplane mode, everything, is, everything else disappears, it's just you and me and we're just going to talk. We're just going to take our walk, whatever's on our minds. Right? There's that exclusive time. What does that do? Just like in our religion, it strengthens our relationship with Allah, right? The daily prayers on their times. The same way, if we can figure out a way to discipline our time with our family members, you don't have to give them all day. Allah didn't ask for all day. Even Allah only asks for a few minutes every few hours, doesn't He? So human beings actually need a lot less, even. But that time, it, it, it's not the, the length of it or the shortness of it. It's the quality of it. If you're sitting with your kids, watching a show, watching a TV show, that's not quality time. Even though you're present there, you're not actually talking to them. So you didn't spend time with each other, you both spent time with a screen. You understand? So it taqul arham can include a lot of times that can slowly but surely, one drip after another, after another, in a few months, in a year, in some time you'll notice that relationship becomes a lot healthier. It's a lot easier to protect. So we come back to the meaning of the word taqwa. Taqwa actually, I keep translating it as spiritual consciousness and protection. We are we're protective of our relationship with Allah. What taqullah? Protect yourselves from hurting the relationship you have with Allah. This is the kind of a nuanced translation of this word. If I lose my taqwa, 
my feeling towards Allah will get weak. I won't feel anything when I pray. I won't feel anything when I make dua. I won't think about it anymore. I'm just going to live my life and I happen to be Muslim. That's a, that's a life of a Muslim without any taqwa. Taqwa is about consciousness and awareness and aware, a protectiveness. I want to protect my feelings towards him. The same way I want to protect my feelings towards Al-Arham. That's the command Allah has given. What taqul arham? Inna Allah kana alaykum raqiba. And Allah at the end adds that He's always been watchful over you. He's, he's protecting over you. In other words, this instruction, one way you can look at this ayah is, this is Allah's way of trying to, of, of asking to protect you, guiding you, guiding me, so that we can live a life where both of these things go hand in hand. And I would finally argue that one of the lessons we can learn from this ayah is the taqwa of Allah and the taqwa of Al-Arham are in fact hand in hand. You cannot have taqwa of Allah and you're not mindful of the family relationships. One will affect the other. And if your relationships are going bad, your relationships with Allah will also suffer. I hope you guys enjoyed that video clip. My team and I have been working tirelessly to try to create as many resources for Muslims to give them first steps in understanding the Qur'an all the way to the point where they can have a deep, profound understanding of the Qur'an. We are students of the Qur'an ourselves and we want you to be students of the Qur'an alongside us. Join us for this journey on BayinaTV.com where thousands of hours of work have already been put in and don't be intimidated, it's step by step by step so you can make learning the Qur'an a part of your lifestyle. There's lots of stuff available on YouTube but it's all over the place. If you want an organized approach to studying the Qur'an beginning to end for yourself, your kids, your family and even among peers, that would be the way to go. Sign up for BayinaTV.com.